Well, hello again, folks. If you've been following my channel for a while, you've seen me build a lot of different things. And if you stick with me, you'll probably see me build a lot more, because building things is just what I do. When you have a sawdust addiction, there's no sense in fighting it. You just got to roll with it, so that's what I do. But whenever I share one of my building projects with you, I find a lot of questions in my comment section. A lot of people trying to stretch their dollars and do things themselves, so they go to YouTube looking for answers. So hopefully I can provide those for you here today, because what I'm going to do is address the most frequently asked questions that I've gotten. Lots of questions come in about the drywall, about venting a crawl space, and about this, that, and the other thing. So, hopefully today you will have the answers that you need, and I can save you a few bucks along the way. All right, so here we go. For this video, I'm going to work my way from the bottom up. Let's start below grade. I'll answer a couple questions that I have about my gray water system. Then we'll work up to the concrete piers and then talk about the crawl space and work all the way up to the ridge pole. There's a lot to cover, so let's get covering. All right, a few years ago, I did a video showing you the gray water system that I use. Very, very simple system to put in. Costs next to nothing. Anyone can do it. But the best thing is it works flawless. I've been using this type of system for many, many years and never once had to dig one up. Okay, I'm not going to bother describing the system because most of you have already seen that. But I'll put a link to the video in the description below. And if you haven't seen it, give it a peek. Okay, help you out with some ideas for making a system of your own. Okay. The couple questions that I get with that, the ones that I get asked all the time, you hear me talk a lot about the frost line, like when I'm putting in concrete piers and whatnot, but my methodology with my leach field is just the opposite when it comes to the frost line. People ask, do I have to put my system beneath the frost line? The answer is absolutely not. In fact, the lower you go in the ground, the deeper you go, the less it will perform. It works that way because the lower, the deeper you go, the closer you are getting to the water level in the ground and the least amount of soil you will have beneath your system for all of that water to, le to leach in. Okay, most, in most cases there's no more than 10 inches or 12 inches of soil above my system. Okay, at the top of the system. And I say the top of the system because I'm going to answer the second question with this. People ask, do I have to have the system level or can it be tilting? I put mine at a gentle slope in most cases. The reason you don't have to go beneath the frost line is because these systems, and including regular septic systems, the decomposing matter in the tank or in the leach field creates its own heat. That's why in a lot of cases where you have a regular concrete septic tank in your backyard, you will have a spot where the snow melts the quickest. You'll have a square in the backyard showing you exactly where your septic tank is. That's because of the heat generated by the decomposing matter in the system. Just recently, somebody was asking me what my thoughts were on pole barn structures. Well, to be honest, my thoughts aren't good. Up here in the North Country, where we have issues with frost, I have seen too many pole barns standing askew, all rick-racked, some heaved up really bad, and it's a very ugly structure. Oh, I'm certain that the builders put them in straight and true, but over time, frost has messed with those poles, throwing the building out of whack. In a video not too long ago, I was showing you how much movement the boulders have in the wintertime. They frost up, protrude out of the ground, then they sink back down. 
And I talked about how I like to pull all of the rocks away from the piers when I'm putting in because that movement will upset the piers. With a pole, actual pole barn structure, whether they're using telephone poles or pressure treated posts, they put the wood beneath the ground, they have their posts sticking up, and then they frame between the poles and put a roof on top. The builders might put them in nice and true, but if there's rocks near these posts which move, they might upset these piers, okay? So an inch or two of movement below the surface of the ground will be a lot of movement up here. See what I mean? Move it a tiny bit, look how much it moves up here. So over time, if there's boulders shifting and heaving in the soil, and they're upsetting these piers, I don't think it's going to be too many years before they look like the structures that I'm trying to avoid. So pole barn structures are pretty cool to use as an equipment shed or wood shed or things like that. But I prefer the method that I use. And when I put down a permit, I call it a pole barn type structure. In a sense, it's a pole barn structure, but I'm using concrete poles beneath the surface of the ground. Concrete poles are sauna tubes, right? It's a round concrete pier. So in the structure that I'm building now, that's exactly what we did. You watched Lori and I put the concrete piers. They came up above the surface of the ground a few inches. Then I went around the perimeter with some pressure treated four by six, and then I framed my structure on top of that. Those concrete piers will stay right where I put them, which will keep my framework just the way I want it. When I first started showing this structure on my channel, and you saw that my concrete piers protruded above the surface of the ground four to six inches, the one question that came in repeatedly is people wanted to know how come I didn't just have my concrete level with the surface of the ground and built up from there, that way I wouldn't have to skirt around the building. Well, on that standpoint alone, it would make a lot of sense to do it that way. But like I said many times, up here in the North Country, we have problems with frost. Okay, so let's go over to my deck and I'll show you a post and I'll give you an example of why I do what I do and why going level with the ground will cause problems that you're going to want to avoid. Okay, here you see my concrete pier is sticking out of the ground, oh, about five and a half inches. Then I have my post sitting on top of it that goes up to my deck. This pier goes below the frost line. In the wintertime, all this ground around the pier will heave up and go back down and repeat the process year after year, but the post will stay exactly where I put it. Never any problems whatsoever. But if I had put the surface of the ground right here near the top of the pier, let me show you what will happen. Sauna tubes are made out of cardboard, but over time they'll disintegrate and entirely disappear, and you end up with dirt against concrete. So let's pretend that this is not cardboard, but it is the dirt surrounding the concrete pier. In the winter time, the dirt around it will heave up just like this. And then in the spring, it sinks back down. But in the winter, when it's heaved up like this, what happens? It creates a bowl. This fills with water and it freezes. And what happens when water freezes into ice? It expands, okay? So you have water in here, it gets beneath this post, it expands and lifts this post way up. Now the post is sitting on ice. In the spring, that melts back down, the dirt sinks back down, and everything ends up back where it belongs. Doesn't really cause any problems with the deck, but if you have a structure that's got walls and windows and roof and all of that, and it keeps moving up and down, over time you're going to have problems with it. So to eliminate those problems, I always have my piers come above the surface of the ground about that much.
Now here on the mountain, because we live off the grid, my approach to venting the crawl space is quite different than it would be than your normal situation. I've shown you in the past how we have an aluminum truck toolbox buried in the dirt beneath the cabin right up to the lid. By trapping the ambient temperature of the ground beneath the cabin, the temperature inside that toolbox maintains right about 55 degrees throughout the entire year. It might get a little bit warmer in the summer, a little bit colder in the winter, but it'll never drop below freezing. By having the temperature maintained right about 55 degrees, it offers us great storage for produce and beverages and things like that. If I vented the crawl space and let the warm summer air or the cold winter air beneath the cabin, I wouldn't be getting the results that I want. I don't worry about issues with moisture and mold because I have bubble foil stapled to the underside of my floor, which keeps the moisture away from the wood. Another question is about putting a vapor barrier, like a tarp, laying a tarp or something like that over the earth. That's another thing that I would recommend for your normal situation. By laying a tarp over the ground, that'll cut down on moisture tremendously. I don't do that because by laying a tarp over the dirt, I will be trapping the ambient temperature of the ground beneath the tarp. Much like when you hang a blanket between two rooms and you'll feel the temperature difference from one side of the blanket to the other. But in a normal situation, yes, I would vent the crawl space and put a vapor barrier over the dirt beneath. And then the question about running heat to keep my pipes from freezing. I have no worries about keeping my pipes from freezing because I'm trapping the ambient temperature of the ground beneath the cabin. If you've been following me for a while, not only have you seen me build all of my structures on concrete piers, but more often than not, you've seen me sheathe them with T111. I love this stuff, and let me tell you why. The T111 that I use is 5 eighths of an inch thick. It's incredibly strong and it offers me my sheathing and my siding all in one shot. That saves me time and money. And plus, I like the look of it. As soon as I sheathe my wall, it's finished and it's ready to stain. Plus, I have the option that later on, if I change my mind and I want to put cedar shingles or vinyl siding or whatever as a different siding, then I just go ahead and put it on top of it. That's a step that I would take if I had sheathed the wall with plywood or OSB. But like I say, as soon as I sheathe the wall, it's all finished. Hey, that's a win-win in my book. But before I talk you into using T111, let me tell you about a few precautions that you should take. Traditionally, when you're sheathing a wall with plywood, you always run the grain of plywood perpendicular to your wall studs. Your wall studs are running in a vertical position, so you run your plywood in a horizontal position, and this will offer the most amount of strength to your wall system. But T111 is meant to be installed in a vertical position. The grain is going up and down. You never want to install T111 as an exterior surface and run it horizontally because rain will gather in every one of these seams. And the only part of your entire project that you want gathering water is your rain gutters. You don't want water collecting on a wooden surface. So when I'm installing T111, I always try to make sure that I have continuous nailing around the entire perimeter of the sheet meaning the bottom of the sheet can get nailed off to the bottom plate of the wall or the box sill below, and the top of the sheet can get nailed off to the top plate of the wall. That is the way that I traditionally build. On this build, however, I had to improvise a little bit. You will see here in this footage that the top of the sheet is missing the top plate by about an inch and a half. 
This happened because I needed to cheat the sheet down a little bit. I wanted it to overlap the pressure treated perimeter by about an inch and a half. I would have just made the wall a little bit shorter so the top of the sheet would be hitting the top plate, but by doing so I would have started cheating the head height that I need for the garage door. I just spoke of the importance of having continuous nailing around the full perimeter of the sheet, but let me show you why. This T111 is 5 eighths of an inch thick right here, and right here, and right here, but it's much less than that where these grooves are. So these grooves actually cause a weak spot in the sheet. So whenever I am nailing off my T111, both at the top and the bottom of the sheet, I always double nail, put a nail on each side of each seam. If you don't do that, you run the risk of the sheets buckling at this weak spot. Because what happens to wood when it gets damp? It expands, right? And if you only have one nail here, or no nails at all, this wood is going to expand and it'll give way right here. So when I built this structure, I was not able to reach the top plate because I had changed my plan a little bit. So after the wall was up, I went around the perimeter, put the nailers in, that enabled me to double nail it the way that I want, and it was worth the effort. Okay, when you're working with a tall wall where you're stacking one sheet over another, let me show you how I go about this. Okay, this would be the top of the sheet. This is the bottom of the upper sheet. I never just put one on top of another. What will happen is water will run down your sheet and then get caught in here. You don't want water being trapped anywhere. So I always install a metal drip cap. So your sheet gets double nailed to your top plate, like I talked about. Then this metal drip cap comes down and protects the end grain. This gets nailed to your framework as well. Then this sheet gets placed on top of the metal. That way any rain coming down here will just get tossed away. There's no chance of it getting into the end grain of this sheet. And I prefer to keep this sheet approximately 3 sixteenths of an inch up off of that metal. That way there's no chance of any water sitting in here and getting wicked up into the end grain of this sheet. And I have this in place and I double nail this one as well. And I have a nice stable wall. Okay, so just a couple more things and then I'm going to wrap this up. You didn't think I was going to get through a building video without talking about bubble foil, did you? But seriously, folks, the number one question that I find in my inbox, like on a daily basis, is people see me using bubble foil to insulate the subfloor of all of my structures and I talk so highly about the performance that I get from it. They all want to know, can this be used in the walls and in the roof? And yes, it can, but I'm not going to take up time in this video to be yakking about it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put the link to the bubble foil that I use in the description below. If you click on that link, you will find recommendations from the manufacturer for those applications. Okay, so go right to the source and you'll find all the information that you're looking for for walls and roofs. Now, many times you have heard me talk about how important it is to vent your roof system. If you have a heated structure and you're not venting the roof properly, you will have issues with condensation, which leads to mold and mildew and rotting the wood. Okay? You don't want any kind of water in your roof system, whether it's a leak in the roof or it's condensation buildup Water is water, and it will destroy things, okay? So simply by venting a roof properly will eliminate that problem. So in this type of a build, I have a vent strip in the eave that allows airflow above the insulation, and then it escapes out the ridge. But people wanted to know, how do you vent a roof 
like this, where you're doing a shed roof addition onto an existing structure. They don't know how to vent this. If you put a vent strip in the eave here, there's no place for the hot air to escape if this is a cathedral ceiling. So you will have to put a flat ceiling above this structure, insulate this ceiling and not the roof. That way this space above the ceiling is a cold space and install some sort of a vent, whether it's a gable vent or you gotta have some way for the air to flow. So you've got a vent strip here in the eave and that allows air above the insulation that's in this flat ceiling and then it exits out here. If you don't let that hot air escape, you will end up having major ice dams here and leakage and condensation buildup. So you need to let that air flow. If you don't want to have a flat ceiling, you would at least have to have a partial flat ceiling. So it's flat here, then sloping here with the venting above your insulation. Well, I hope that answers all the questions that you had. If you find my ramblings beneficial, please subscribe to the channel because there'll be more building and more information coming soon. But that's it for now, folks. All the best to you and God bless. Frank and the boss out walking in the woods, living life happy and free. Tracks in the snow everywhere they go, there's a pokey way up in that tree. A beaver built a pond where they have some fun, taking life a day at a time. Best friends until the end, Frankie and the boss, Frankie and the boss. Frankie and the boss